Hello and welcome to Learning Space. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. Uh, joining me this week, I have Dr. Jillian Scudder, and she is someone that doesn't just work to put science in your brain, but works to answer all the awesome, unusual, weird, and never dumb questions folks may have to ask. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. Can can you please give our audience a little bit of an introduction to what you do? To what I do, sure. Well, it's great to be here, so thanks for having me. Um, so I have a, a multi-tiered approach. So I have uh, my research track where I study what happens when you smash galaxies together. As one or what does. What happens when the universe smashes them together for you, which is more likely what I get to watch. Yes. Um, and then I have this whole other uh, track where I uh, have this blog that I've been running for about five years. And when I started it, I said, oh, I don't have ideas. I would like other people to give me ideas. And so I set it up as a question and answer blog where I would get people to send in questions, and then I would go, oh, I wouldn't have come up with that question. I don't even know the answer to that question. And then I would come up with the research. I would go, well, I know where to look. And so I'd go look, and I'd figure it out, and then I'd stare with it, and I'd type it up as best I could, and then send it back out and wait for the next question. No. No, you didn't just set up a blog. You set up something where all the cool kids go to hang out. What exactly was it that you set up? Uh, which, what are you referring well, to? Well, you, you were on Tumblr. Oh, I was on Tumblr. I set up a Tumblr blog because of the tagging system. And I figured if you were going to start somewhere and you wanted to reach a whole bunch of people who were curious about space, then I might accidentally reach a bunch of them if I could insert myself into the tag system. And that worked pretty well. I was pleasantly surprised with how it went and people were finding it and sending in questions. And uh, it stayed on Tumblr as its primary place for a really long time. It's still there. Now, you, as you, you said, are a research astronomer. You study uh, galaxy collisions. Uh, this is one of the most awesome and violent things that we can study in astronomy. Uh, I studied the butcher omler effect in galaxy clusters. So related ah. research, not identical, but um, we speak one another's language. Yes. Now, extragalactic astronomy is one of the more competitive fields of astronomy. It is... Um, one of the ones where you just basically have to quite often keep your nose in your research, or at least this is what our advisors tell us. Mm -hmm. Now, you broke away and, and found the time to do something entirely different. What, what was it that motivated you to do this thing that is so contrary to what we are often advised to do with our lives? Honestly, I was so tired of the passive voice. <laughs> it was... I was so tired of writing in the passive voice. <laughs> and so I went, I need to write something else that isn't just a science paper. And I wasn't convinced that the blog was actually going to go anywhere. I sort of figured maybe it would go for six months and then there wouldn't be any more questions or it wouldn't yeah. have reached the right number of people or just wasn't going to work. Um, but in the meantime, I figured I would have at least practiced writing in a non-technical way and that right. just seemed like it was a good idea <laughs> now what what level were you at uh, you were a postdoc i think when you started all of this i was a graduate student you were still a graduate student okay yeah. so did you tell people initially or was it just sort of like the quiet thing you did on the side under the astroquizzical name it was really quiet for a while. I think I did tell my advisor that I was doing it, um, but my name was not attached to the blog for uh, several years. And, and I was just sort of like, mm, I'll just see how this goes for yeah. a bit. <laughs> no, I, I totally get that. I totally get that. Uh, it It's the great contradiction of what we do where 
when we write grants, they all say, here's my science, here's my broader impact. Uh, we are all told it's important to educate the public, but we kind of do it on the sly when we want to do new and awesome and creative things. Mm -hmm. Now, at what point did you decide, you know, I can stick my name on everything and own this, this I think cool it was, thing? I'm not quite sure when I decided to put my name on it, but I think it was about the time when I was starting to become more comfortable with the fact that it was continuing yeah and that it was growing and that I think it was about the time when I bought the domain for the for the own its own website so I said if I'm gonna pay money into this thing yeah I'm gonna put my name on it now um, and I but I think it took me about two years before I was really comfortable with it as an an establishing thing where I was sort of like okay now I'm gonna I'm gonna own this now and I also was having more conversations with more mentors and they were sort of like, well, if people aren't interested in you in addition to like, because of this outreach, yeah, then probably that's not going to be a great place for you to be. No, that, that is entirely true. You were, you were given very good advice there. Now it, it has grown from being more than just a domain that you purchased. Yes. You recently came out with a book that has gotten some pretty cool reviews. How how did that come into happening? It was there was a point where I looked at my blog and I said, I've written a whole book worth of stuff. And then I then I sort of started pinging people that I knew who had more book connections. And I said, How did how did you get into book writing? Once I had it in my head as like, oh, I've written a book's worth of stuff, I sort of went, it should be a book. And then it was this little bee in my ear that I couldn't get rid of. And so I was pinging people and being like, how did you get into book writing? Have you done this? Have you done this? Who do you know? Do we know anybody? And effectively, I, I found someone who did popular astronomy book writing. Uh -huh. And he pointed me towards the, a publisher that he had worked with before, who was friendly and nice and was accepting pitches basically and then i uh had many rounds of back and forth with the publisher to be like okay so they would come back and be like we like how you write but it needs to be in a slightly different format because a question and answer blog has a series of things attached to it that doesn't really work in book format like yeah. that's fair so we sort of went back and forth for a while until we found a format that worked for both of us um, so for our listeners, what is that format that you settled the on? The format is of a, a family tree. Okay. And so that's, took, that's part of your subtitle. It is part of the subtitle. So we, we took this idea that um, in order for you to form planets, you have to have a star. Because the planets form out of the dust and gas that did not become the star. Right. And so in that sense, the planets are the children of the star. And the star needs a galaxy to live in. So the star is the child of the galaxy. And the galaxy requires its own network of things in order to form. And so you have the galaxy as the child of the universe at large. And it's, it was a pleasing metaphor for me and they liked it. So we're both like, yeah, we can work with this. We can yeah. do this. That sounds kind of awesome. And, I liked it. <laughs> so I, I've brought up your book on the screen, and I will share the link out to everyone. Now, you have transitioned through the course of doing all of this from being a graduate student working with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to a postdoc working on Kepler. You've been working on some of the biggest collaborations in astronomy and then going home to sit at your keyboard and just communicate out to the internet, which may be the largest collection of humans. <laughs> yep. It, how, how has it been having both these parts of your career grow side by side? And do you ever find yourself feeling torn between how you balance it all? And yes, go ahead. 
Yeah. I had it. So when I started having to actually sit down and write the book out, because even though it was all, the material had all come from the things that I'd written for the blog, mm -hmm. but I still had to rewrite it. And sitting down to write the book again, there was a real moment of, okay, do I have enough time for this and for research? How can I balance this? And I wound up in that case asking if I could work, uh, at, if I could spend some time at work uh, writing the book and if that would count as um, outreach time. Yes. And I said, okay, you can do half a day a week. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it has been tricky. And especially when you go, when you spend all day at work and then you come home and you're just exhausted and you don't want to anymore. Wow. I, yes. Yeah, it's, there's, there's a certain amount of energy that we each get every day and sometimes one faculty meeting can consume all of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and you're now a professor you're at Oberlin College you're you're an assistant mm -hmm. professor on your way hopefully to great and wonderful things and and so do you find that your colleagues um, are are interested in what you're doing are are they supportive and how have you had to educate them about what it's like to do outreach on the internet they think it's super cool that I am doing this. So they've been really supportive and that's been really nice. They haven't been, um, I don't think they have any inclination to do it themselves. So I haven't really done much um, instruction on what it's like, but they think it's cool that I'm doing lots of writing and they're really excited that I've been doing all of these things and that I've been able to reach so many people. And, and a book is a tangible thing that everyone understands. It's so cool to have it <laughs> physically. I'm not over that yet because it was a blog for so long. <laughs> it's not a tangible thing. And now it's just like I, I wrote all of these words in here. Yes. And now I can hold them. <laughs> and, and they're good words that you can inflict upon others as Christmas <laughs> gifts. You can't give a blog as a Christmas gift. I had I had a friend of mine um, send me something from the book and he was reading it and he sent me a quote from it and I was like, I don't remember it. I don't remember that. <laughs> but that sounds like something I wrote. <laughs> I, I yes, I understand that completely. Uh, so you've had this awesome journey. If if you were to meet a young astronomer, the, the future you who is currently in graduate school, and they were trying to find their voice, what would you encourage them to do and not do based on your experiences? I have in the past encouraged students, if they are keen to do outreach, mm -hmm. I encourage them to try it because you can always stop. Yes. If you find that it's not fun, or you're not having a good time, or you tried it and it just wasn't enjoyable, you can always stop. But if you want to do it, and you don't, you're always going to have that like, ah, uh, in the back of your mind. And so, but everyone, what's cool is that everyone wants to do something different. Yes. So I've talked to students who are like, I really want to make a YouTube channel. Like, try it. it. Yeah, see how it is. Turn off the comments, probably, but see how it is. Um, and I'm sorry, like that was just story. the best advice. <laughs> I do give I do give slightly different advice to the young women who yeah. want to do outreach, um, in that they should be a little bit cautious with their um, the amount of internet they're willing to expose themselves to yeah um so turn off the comments on the youtube channels is is one just because you get different responses from people um but in general I just tell people to go for it whatever it is that they have in their brain that they want to try and do just try it and if you like it 
you'll be good at it. And if you're good at it, it'll go somewhere. Now, you brought up the unfortunate truth that being a woman on the internet and being a man on the internet are not the exact same experience. Have, have you learned some of these lessons the hard way? I've been pretty lucky. And I think a large fraction of that is because I started it so anonymously. Yes. Um, and by the time I was willing to put my name on things, I was a little bit more established. Um, I also don't have comments set up on the blog, so that's not a thing that has ever been enabled, really. Tumblr has its own system, yes. but um, that's less visible to the first person who posts on it. So I kind of set myself up in a way that I would be able to easily remove myself from trouble that was related to what I was writing about. Um, and I have been pretty lucky. The people who have been reading and writing in to me have been very sincere in their questions and so I don't feel like I've, ha I've dealt with what there is out there. Um, but I think that was sort of by design. I was a little overcautious in the early days, which sort of set myself up for a different path. Yeah, I'm not sure there is such a thing as overly cautious. <laughs> Uh, I think we all have to take slightly different strategies. So I, I am lucky to have the most amazing set of moderators who are mm. out there with Thor's ban hammer, keeping this a safe space. Right. And, and so by providing a space where all questions are welcome, but being evil is not we we have built a really cool place where where people can come in and um yeah they they can build friendships on the internet which isn't something that there's many safe spaces for doing that at least That's not true. anymore mm. and yeah. and with what you're doing, do you find that you do have regulars who send you consistently excellent questions, or is it just constantly new voices? Well, they're all anonymous. Oh, so you have no idea. So I have no idea. Oh, wow. And this is part of why I was very happy to see that the questions I get sent are all very sincere. Uh, all the questions are anonymous, and I did that from the very start because I figured if you had to own up to this question, would you still ask it? Yeah, that, that's valid. And in a lot of cases, I think the answer is no. It's a good question, but they don't want to ask it with the name attached. I do now have some people who sign their submissions. Um, every so often I'll get a name in a, in a, in a city and I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> you do want your name to be attached. Yes, some um, some people really, really do. Um, but most of them come in with no names and they're totally anonymous, and I just let it be a question in the in the void. I have had a couple of people who submit the question. At least one person who submitted a question and then couldn't remember if they actually hit submit and then submitted it again. Um, but in general, I have no idea. That's, that's excellent. Now, you get all sorts of different questions spanning from the physics of video games to the physics of our actual universe. Mm -hmm. um, what have been your favorite questions and what have been your audience's favorite questions? The most popular article on my entire site is why we only see one side of the moon. Did that surprise you? Yes. I was not expecting it to be overwhelmingly the most popular and most trafficked question on the whole site. And it has stayed that way for years. Um, because I, I went through not just the, okay, well, it orbits once at every time, but, okay, yeah. but why? And it has just stayed an evergreen, ever popular post. That was a surprise. That's 
Um, it's it's a legit question. And it is. People are curious about the moon. Yeah. Moon questions do well. <laughs> People are really like the questions about the moon. <laughs> uh, and the ones that are most fun for me, I think, are the ones that are either really unexpected or really hypothetical. Um, so one of my all-time favorites is a question that got sent in by um, a dad of a five-year-old. Uh-huh. And the five-year-old, they were talking about the universe, and the five-year-old came up with this idea that what if the universe was tiger-shaped, and if you had enough fuel in your spacecraft, you'd go out the tiger's mouth? And the dad then writes that, well, we asked my five-year-old, what's outside the tiger? I go, dinosaur bones. And... And they go, so then this dad just goes, any help? <laughs> he just wanted a way to explain about the shape and and size and scale of the universe to their five-year-old. It's like, this is the most precious yeah. thing. And yeah. I love it. That's... So that was, that was one of my favorites. How, how do you handle all of the questions about things that are neither provable nor unprovable like string theory at the current moment mm. I haven't had a huge number of really specific questions about string theory okay. um, there have been a couple where it's sort of like well what about the multiverse kind yeah. of thing which is tied into string theory in that way um and generally what I do is I say, well, it's a theory, mm -hmm. which in physics means this set of things. It's, you know, mathematically plausible, um, but we won't be able to say for sure if it's there or not, if, unless it can be tested. And so if you can make the test, then we can do the science and figure out how much further we should push this idea. If you can't make the test and you can't push it any further, then you have a nice mathematical model. Or an ugly, complex mathematical model. Or a very complex mathematical model. You have a mathematical model to which many people are very attached. Yes. But which may be nothing more than a mathematical model in terms of, do you, are you explaining our universe that we live in? Right. And uh, it at a certain point comes down to the d difference between uh, Kepler's theories of planetary motion that described the motion without any forces and Newton who was able to put all the pieces together and make future predictions. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's I, I congratulate you for creating a space that isn't filled with string theory questions. I have not <laughs> been so lucky. <laughs> I get a surprisingly large number of questions about um, the solar system and black holes. Yes, yes. And very few about galaxies, which I'm sad about as a galaxy person. <laughs> have, have you seen over the years that what questions you get asked the most are, are changing as what gets the most press releases is changing? I did get a large number of questions about Planet Nine when that was first announced. Um, so when there was this first, the first announcement that uh, maybe there's this ninth hypothetical planet way out, way beyond Pluto, I got a lot of questions about that. Like, well, is that real? Like, well, I don't know yet. Maybe yeah. there's anybody else. Like, well, what is taking so long? There were so many papers last year. This is just as fast as we can do science. <laughs> yes. And the sky is big. It's big and it's going to be faint and it's just hard. And we don't know how reflective it is. Yes. So that one was one where I did really notice the difference from the press releases coming in. And, and what I've noticed is a gradual sway to more and more news about exoplanets and our own mm. solar system and fewer and fewer press releases about the distant universe. It's, it's as though everyone is holding their breath for James Webb to launch. Mm. And I, I, want, I want more high redshift as well. 
please, please give me a Z of at least 0.3. Point three. Oh. <laughs> you don't have to go very far. Just yeah. <laughs> point three. Yeah. That's now what we call what low to intermediate redshift. <laughs> and it's it's crazy how the definitions of low, high, big, little change with time. Because when I was working on my dissertation, high redshift was point three. Yeah. Laughing is loud. Has, yeah. Intermediate has changed dramatically since I, like, in my postdoc years. It right. went from meaning, what, probably 0.5 to 1.5 to now, like, 1.5 to 3. Yes. <laughs> and, and one of my favorite waste of time sports in graduate school was... <laughs> Uh, in ADS going in and doing a search on high redshift and then sorting into uh, actual numerical values where all of those papers landed. <laughs> that does seem like a good game. It, especially when you're trying to figure out exactly what you need to reference in your literature review. <laughs> So now we have an audience out there that has some questions of their own that they'd love to ask. Are you game to answer some of our I'm audience's questions? Game to give it a shot. The answer might be, I don't know, but and, we can go for it. And that's okay. I say I don't know a lot as well. And <laughs> I, I like to say that scientists, we don't know everything, but we would like to, but we don't yet. It's true. Okay, so Silent Searchlight is asking, how plausible would it be for a planet with a human-level civilization on it to have a moon with phases? And he's linking to a picture. Um, this is an anime with... Uh, so the moon in this particular uh, anime world is one that is breaking apart, but still... Um, for lack of a better phrase, um, I will call it a rubble pile of a moon. Oh, oh okay, I got the image. Oh, that doesn't look good. No, no, I'm, I'm seeing seven eaves written all over this. Yeah, that seems, that seems bad for the planet underneath it. Why did that happen? We okay, need to read so the anime see. to find out. Well, yes. Okay, so this, I mean, you could do it. Like, if that moon had recently been lasered, then you could have a civilization underneath that still has a moon without those chunks coming down and destroying that planet. But that doesn't look like a sustainable long-term moon setup. <laughs> well, and, and the interesting thing about it is... Um, the amount of the moon that is being torn apart seems to vary with phase. So the full moon is whole and the new moon is completely shattered. So uh, I'm not even sure how you get that. Okay, you've got a hollow bubble moon. Okay. And then one half of it is shattered. I like where you're going with this. And then the other half is where you get the full moon from. So the mole men of the moon built a hollow sphere that they were living inside. And then something went terribly wrong. Something, something went terribly explodey <laughs> inside because they're all going, all the pieces are going out. Yes. Um, yes, this is, this is not a good long-term solution <laughs> for your... <laughs> <laughs> your civilization down below because if you have an exploding moon those are coming towards you when it's in the new moon phase <laughs> yes and and so we have a clarifying question in other words the moon is not tidally locked it would not be able to in that scenario no if, if you have one half of an exploded shell that would be a fast rotating moon yes yes so Fenmil is asking a question. So the new paper Andromeda that it cannibalized the third largest galaxy in our local group. Um, how do they figure that size? I haven't read that paper. Have you? I haven't read the paper either, but I saw it come past. And I think what they did was they were looking at the number of stars that were um, flung around 
Andromeda. Okay. And then they also have information on the size of the black hole at the center of the remnant of that galaxy. Oh. And the size of the black hole correlates really well normally with the mass of the galaxy. Or at least so with we, the sphere of the galaxy. Or, yes. So um, if you have both of those, you should be able to make a reasonable estimate on how big it is, or it was. Yeah, you, you can at least put lower limits on it. Yeah. So so we do run into the cases of like the Sombrero galaxy doesn't really have a supermassive black hole, and it has no sphere. Um, so there are these relationships but if you know how big the sphere was and you make basic estimates of, well, it has to be bigger than that, um, it helps you figure out a lot. Okay, yeah, papers. So I, I, I need to go find that paper now. Fadmill, yeah, I feel saw it come past and I was furiously trying to get my own paper out and so it didn't happen. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, Fadmill, you need to send me that link. I now want to know. Um, so, uh, looking to see. Um, so, Hanny's Vorverp is asking, uh, are there any suggestions as to how the supermassive black hole of the Triangulum Galaxy disappeared? I don't know about this. I think okay. this is one that's another flat galaxy. Um, So I, I will have to look up more about this. Um, Generally, the issue with supermassive black holes is that if they're too small, it's hard to detect them. Yeah, so they, they've uh, placed an upper limit of 3,000 solar masses on it. Um, this small. is, yeah, this is pretty much a face on um, elliptical, not elliptical, a face on spiral galaxy. Uh, kind of heading towards grand design um, mm -hmm. doesn't have a big spheroid as near as you can tell looking at it face on so I'm not sure if this is one that disappeared as much as um, you don't have to have one we're finding if you don't have that sphere in the center um it is local, Hanny. That that is entirely true. Um, Those are the only times where you can really get a good measurement on the black hole, anyways. Yeah, it's such a hard measurement to make. It's well, face on is is particularly hard because you can't get the Doppler shifting of the core rotation. Yeah. <sighs> Silly galaxies. <laughs> Why can't they all be lined up just exactly, right? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Let's have everything at a nice 45 degree tilt and exactly 45 so we can do the maths. There was there was a really good um, April Fool's Day archive paper uh, several years ago where they said, well, we, fi we figured out how to correct for the inclination of the galaxy. All you have to do is just tilt the CCD, tilt the camera. And then it'll, it'll fix itself. And we all went, oh, if I only it were that easy. <laughs> I know, I know. This is the struggle that we constantly deal with. <laughs> <sighs> so <laughs> um, one, one of our uh, audience members, Paranor, uh, commented 45 degrees. Why not 42? It is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. It truly, truly is. It's not a is. geometrically nice number, though. No, no, no. I don't want to do those maths. So the reason is lazy. Yes. <laughs> so uh, one silent storming is saying, does astronomy use gravitational field of T-field equations of general relativity instead of Newtonian gravity in a calculation. So I, I think what this is asking, um, when when we're doing basic calculations, do we rely on Newtonian or relativistic uh, calculations? It very much depends on what the calculation is for. So if you want um, something that's not moving very fast to figure out what's happening there, then you can get away with Newtonian gravity. 
if you want something that is going to be zipping out at close to the speed of light, then you're going to have to do it properly. And, and this can be a something that is either being accelerated away from us due to the annoying expansion of the universe, <laughs> uh, or it can uh, be something getting ejected from a system. So we often will see jets that we have to deal with relativity when making calculations about the jets. Or just a really big explosion. Yeah, that too. That too. Uh, you were unfortunate and you did your PhD post discovery of uh, Lambda, uh, dark energy. That made all the math so much worse. (laughs) I can imagine. (laughs) Yeah. um, I I had Although I was doing my PhD on very local galaxies. So by and large, it was I was safe. (laughs) Okay, I I had to redo all my calculations. Um, But these things happen and anyone who says that astronomers are unwilling to accept new theories and new ideas was not around in 1998 to watch everyone go ah shit (laughs) (laughs) Ah. Uh, yeah all the math got harder um So looking to see what other questions we may have. Uh, Paranor is now wagging his finger at space time. That's uh, fair. It is fair. It is totally fair. Um, I shake my fist at space time regularly. It, it deserves it. It deserves yes. it. And it can take it. Um, yeah. So do we have more questions? Um Uh, so for those of you who joined late and don't know what you stumbled into while people <laughs> type, li- type in their questions, uh, this is Learning Space. We are a production of CosmoQuest. We invite you to visit CosmoQuest.org and help us explore our solar system, including our own planet Earth through a variety of different citizen science projects. We have scientists really really wanting maps of mars and mercury and we will be doing a scientific presentation in december so please please map mercury people and mars mars needs your love too uh so cosmoquest is a collaboration uh of the astronomical society of the pacific youngstown state university the planetary science institute and a variety of other institutions Give us a follow and you can catch all of our content here on Twitch. We bring you a Monday through Friday update on all that is new in space and astronomy at 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. London, 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, We also have this show on Thursdays alternating between following daily space and being in this evening time block uh, for those out in the Pacific Rim. Uh, We also have astronomy office hours, Tuesday nights and Sundays, and an Astro 101 course, Wednesdays and Fridays. Your follow will bring you announcements on all these different things, and we are sustained through your subscriptions, and every bit really helps. Um, So I see Fenmil is asking, has there been any better idea on the number of satellites around the Milky Way from the Gaia data? Oh, I think they found a couple more. Yeah. Um, How long is it going to take us to be able to finally get a final number on how many dwarfs we have and are actively consuming? I don't know. How long is Guy (laughs) running? Five years? And I, I don't think it's going to get the entirety of the sky, which means there's going to be whole sections. Yeah. Well, Gaia will get us pretty far. Yeah. Um, It will at least get us a firm limit for one region on the sky. And if we assume a constant distribution of of dwarfs around our galaxy, we can at least estimate it. Yes, although I don't know what the status of this is, but for a while there was a suggestion that there was a plane of dwarfs around the Milky Way where a bunch of things had fallen in at once. They're, and they're all sort of kept into their coherent orbit. There, there was a really cool paper recently 
where uh, using Gaia data, uh, mm. they they were following up on that particular plane, and they found that. Um, there is a set of globular clusters in this plane, and it seems to indicate we ate a fairly significant sized something. We could have stripped dwarves off of it. We definitely swore stripped globular clusters off of it. And part of what made it visible is these globulars are orbiting uh, in the opposite direction of what would be expected and had consistent kind of sort of ages and chemical compositions um, that were distinctly different from other more native globular cluster populations. Um, Neat. Yeah. So it's... Okay, that's great. It's, <laughs> it's, so um, someone just did something awesome because I got... Thank you for the follow. Um, we just had someone give our channel a follow, which means they will be getting notified of whenever we go live with new content. Um, so if we can get some rocket ships lighting up the chat, um, I would appreciate it. Um, so Hanny is asking how much star stuff is actually between the galaxies. I would think a lot of stuff gets flung away. So the answer to that is for a long time, we assumed that there wasn't much, and now we are finding that there is more than we thought, which is making our lives much more inconvenient. And um, can you explain some of these inconveniences for the people who haven't had to do photometry? Sure. So, well, there's a couple of things that are inconvenient. One is, do you want to have an end to your galaxy ever? Because at some point, you get out into fainter and fuzzier and dimmer and thinner, wispier bits of gas. I mean, is this still part of the galaxy? Yeah. How far out do I have to go? Yeah. So th that's one problem. Um, and yeah, so this is your photometry problem. I mean, if you keep looking at a galaxy and you stare at it longer and longer and longer, you get more and more and more and more galaxy. So at some point you have to figure out how much do you want to spend on this? Like, how much time do you need, can you spend? Is this, <laughs> what, what do you want to do? And, Where and should we call our it? own galaxy's dust changes the galaxy. color of other galaxies. So yes, our galaxy has a big pile of dust and if you try to look through it, it makes everything red. Which is usually not the color of the thing you're trying to look at. It's so. it's quite frustrating, and <laughs> it's it's not like the dust is nice and uniform as we look in different parts of the sky. No, it has to be clumpy and lumpy and bumpy, causing a different correction in every different direction. So the Herschel data that I was working with, um, it as part of my postdoc, there were pieces regions of the sky where you just could not look because there was too much dust. Yeah from our own galaxy. And if you wanted to see the dust from deeper galaxies or high, high redshift galaxies, you just weren't going to see it. Right. Our galaxy was too bright. And there was a portion in a relatively clean field um, that still had lots of dust in it. And the poor graduate student who was working on trying to remove this um, named it the seagull because it had this kind of seagully shape to it. She just Developed a deep hatred for that seagull. <laughs> I, yes, yes. This this is our lot in life when we're graduate students. There's always that one thing that needs to die. Yes. Now, it, you worked on a spacecraft before. You you understand the the eager anticipation of data. I want data. Um, mm. We have Paranor asking, how excited are you for TESS finally starting its mission? I am always excited for new missions. TESS is one that I'm probably not going to be working yeah. with for a little while, but like Gaia, I want to see what it does. I'm always excited when there's new new gadgets in space. Ooh, yeah, show me your data. It's like the Juno data. Like, am I going to use it? No. Is it cool? <laughs> yes. And, and for me, spacecraft are dead until they, they have sent back data. Um, I, I had an x-ray mission I needed blow up on launch or blow ups shortly after launch blow up mm. before there was data 
Yes. And and so rather than getting emotionally invested in spacecraft that haven't yet produced data, I, I simply keep them at arm's length. So Hitomi must have been especially bad for you. <sighs> yeah. So, yeah. I, I have to admit, Tess is going to remain dead to me until we get data back that we see that is quantified and that is doing <laughs> what it is supposed to be doing. When the test folks start getting really excited, I'll get excited with them. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so looking to see. Oh, I see someone asking if I meant edge as in end of the galaxy or edge something. Else. I meant like, where do you call the yeah. physical spatial extent of the galaxy? At some point we think that the stars have to stop belonging to a galaxy so you should be able to draw contour like within this region of space is the galaxy and that's becoming harder to do it it's basically urban sprawl dust style <laughs> <laughs> and and this is where scientifically we we've long done things like calculate the width of the brightest part of the thing, extend out a certain number of those widths from the edge, use that for your primary calculations. And where we're getting stuck now is all of those initial, this is how you measure it, were based on not knowing everything else was out there. Yep. This is the moral of my last two science papers. It's like, hey, guys, you know those simplifying assumptions that you were making? Yeah, I have bad news. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have bad news for those assumptions. Well, data. We need more of it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so um, Hanny is asking, could you end the galaxy at the end of the dark matter halo? Oh man, if you could find that, it would be yeah. great. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could. <laughs> um, if you're working with theoretical data, I think they do. Yeah. So if you are in a computer simulation, you can track all of the dark matter particles and where they stop, you can say, well, that's the end of my galaxy. And, uh, and I'm wondering if anyone has used micro lensing to try and trace the dark matter halo of a relatively nearby galaxy the way we do with galaxy clusters i don't know because that it, it may be that they're too close to do a, a good micro lensing study but yeah, that so that would be an intriguing way to approach it well yeah so micro lensing you usually need a dense object like relatively that's dense. why it works on galaxy clusters dark matter yeah but then you get weak lensing and strong lensing depending on how close the yeah. light is coming to the center of it so with an individual galaxy you might be able to get some weak lensing out of it but yeah I think it's and weak lensing is the right word i was yeah. combining it with the Macho Project, which I was reading ah. about. Yeah, weak lensing is really hard. Weak lensing is is super hard, but some of the results, like from the Cosmos team, this this is uh, where teams have studied um, how sets of galaxies at a variety of different distances have had their shapes distorted, where without some sort of systematic distortion, you'd expect the average of the galaxies to be a circle on the sky. But if the average is instead a teardrop, a, a pretzel, that doesn't happen, but it would be cool. Um, if the average shape is something other than round, then there is essentially a lens, in this case, a weak gravitational lens that is distorting those galaxies. And by measuring the distortions experienced by volumes of galaxies spread at a variety of different distances, we can interpolate what the amount of dark matter is in those volumes that is then affecting the background material. 
with Cosmos, they actually were able to get a three-dimensional map of where they think the dark matter was in the volume of space that they were studying. And this work has been replicated um, to much less fanfare but awesome science by several other teams. Um, but again, I think they put down a contour, right, where there's yeah. it's a certain amount over dense here. Yes. So you can't say there are no dark matter particles outside of that 3D model, which looked amazing. Um, but you can say above, above a threshold, here's the contour. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so Larry is asking, is weak lensing the same as micro lensing? Because I screwed up. No, no, it's not. Um, so uh, weak lensing is the situation of you have random foreground object. In this case, I'm going to use a meteorite and a <laughs> background object, in this case, a turtle. And as the foreground object passes in front of the background turtle, um, light rays that otherwise would have gone off in directions that don't get to the observer get bent towards the observer. And those extra light rays that the gravity from this foreground object bends um, cause this background turtle to appear significantly brighter. Now, because the foreground object is orbiting our Milky Way, um, this is a transitory event that relies on this precise alignment occurring for a moment in time. Um, to try and study these kinds of microlensing events, there have been two major scientific programs, one to look at the dense sphere of stars in the center of our galaxy, and one to look at the Magellanic Clouds. And both of these studies have turned up amazing things um, and have shown that you can't account for all of the dark matter by saying, oh, there's just a bunch of, well, dead rocks in space that aren't reflecting light. Um, they have actually found at least one and possibly more, I'm, I'm having a memory fail, um, planets orbiting stars that otherwise would never have been noticed this way. Wasn't this how they did that planet in Andromeda? I don't know. I don't know. They found an exoplanet in Andromeda, and I think it was a microlensing event. I think it would have to be if it was in Andromeda. Because everyone was like, how did you do that? Yeah. 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 That's just crazy. Well, I think I'll have to look at it. Yeah. But they did find an exoplanet in Andromeda, and everyone, all the science people I knew were just like, what? Yeah. I think that's how? the correct response. Um. So, so Hanny is asking, do scientists know whenever a microlensing event that is scientifically significant is about to occur? Well, they can predict it sometimes, but you have to know where everything is ahead of time. Yeah. Um, it's easier to let a telescope tell you something got bright. Uh, if you have a telescope that's taking snapshots at a regular cadence and something suddenly gets brighter and then fades again, you can go back and be like, wait a minute, what happened there? And, and then find them easily that way. And well, one of the things that's been super cool is uh, the Macha project has been detecting objects with a four meter telescope. I don't remember which one, I'm sorry. Um, but it's like one, so it's stuck in one place on the surface of our rotating planet. And so they've been working with a group of amateur astronomers in New Zealand to allow them to do further follow up on the objects that they discover. So no microlensing event goes incompletely observed. And I love those worldwide collaborations. Yes. So thank you for dropping a link uh, into the chat to the new scientist okay. article. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> the first extragalactic exoplanet, yes. Yeah. I'm looking for the word micro. Yep, it was found using microlensing. So Hooray. great memory. I remembered a thing. You totally remembered a thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> John is like, we'll send more little planets. <laughs> um, So do we have any more <laughs> questions out there? Um, we've been going for 
about an hour. And, and while I wait for final questions to get dropped in, one of the questions I like to, to ask our guests is, what would you tell that young person looking to have a career like yours as they're trying to figure out how to get from, well, not being a scientist, perhaps being a high school kid, perhaps being someone working in a completely different field. What would Mm. you tell them as they're getting ready to set off on their journey? It's not easy. No. And because it's not easy, you, it has to be something that you're going to want to do even though and almost because it's not easy. So astronomy is not easy and continuing a career path in astronomy is not easy, but I like it. And and, and the like not it. easy isn't just the difficulty of the subject. No, although that's not helping. <laughs> it's, it is, but it is something that I'm willing to put a, a lot of effort into continuing to be able to do it. And so if you have that thing where you're willing to just be like, no, I'm going to do it and I'm going to get good at it and I'm going to do the thing. I'm going to be a, whatever it is, uh, whether it's an astronomer or you're going to be a geologist or you're going to be a chemist, or just whatever that thing is in your brain where you're like, no, I'm going to do this. That is that can carry you because you're going to have bad days and it's not going to be good. Yeah. But if you can have that like stubbornness folded in. Motivated by anger is the way I often do it. (laughs) I don't know that it was motivated by anger so much as I was motivated out of just sheer pig headedness. It's like, I'm getting a PhD and nothing's going to stop me. Like, okay. So it's going to happen. And the, the thing that I always found was, and I think this is what you're saying, that if someone doesn't feel that they'll be complete without studying it, that, that's that thing that is telling you to keep going forward. Yeah. And also just that, you know, it's okay to change your mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. And if you if you get halfway through or you get to that PhD and you've got it and then you go, this isn't doing it for me, you can change your mind. Yeah. They can't take your PhD away from you. No. And you can change your mind back later. It's really damn hard. I don't recommend it. But (laughs) but you can change your mind and get back into research astronomy. Yeah. So it's a it's always a staged process so you say well what do i want to do right now okay let's take steps towards that and then i've taken my three steps is that still the direction i want to go Mm -hmm. yeah okay let's keep going that yeah i agree completely and i hope that you have many many steps in front of you and that while it will always be hard, that at least your road is kept clear. Mm. Now, um, what is the most exciting thing that you're getting to study right now? Oh man, okay. So I have a whole bunch of data from the Manga survey. Uh-huh. And the Manga survey is looking at very nearby galaxies but instead of just an image, you have a spectrum at every pixel. Oh, is I? Which instrument did they do that with? Uh, they reused. This is an on the SDSS telescope. Okay. And they reused a bunch of Boss spectra, and That's they made awesome. new fiber bundles out of them. Um, and so there's like super, and then they dither. So you've got sub. Uh, fiber sampled imaging. Yeah. So I can look at maps of what's going on inside galaxies and they're way better than anything I've seen before and they look so cool. The that... data is going to be a huge pain in the butt to deal with because there's so much of it. Yeah. But it looks amazing because 
You know, in the in galaxy simulations where you get these filaments and fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, it doesn't look that good. I'm starting to see it. And this is a lot higher resolution than the early Fabre Perot spectroscopy stuff that was done. I think so. And yeah. I know what we always did was we just put the slit along the galaxy and step the image sideways yes. and you can do that you can do that <laughs> we did that um but this is way better this way more precise so cool and so it's just super fun to start to see like the knots where stars were like oh that's cool and then like oh this galaxy's got this weird army thing what's going on there and i was just sitting and i just I made maps of all these galaxies, and then I spent like three hours just going through them all. <laughs> Ooh, hey, what? Oh, oh, that's what? Oh, this, and then I just like cackled to myself for <laughs> another three hours. I, I love that. Like sometimes the only reaction you can have to amazing science results is to giggle. <laughs> like, this is so cool I'm just going to giggle at the results it's like what is it doing I don't know but it's cool yes, yes. <laughs> that so, yeah I'm really excited about the data that's coming out of that survey it's gonna be really cool well I I can't wait to see the papers and uh you know keep doing all the things that you're doing because it sounds like you are finding this kind of awesome path forward that is balancing the giggling over your science while finding joy and helping other people understand science. And that's a pretty unique and awesome line to be walking. It has been fun so far. So. Well, we're going to have to have you back someday in the future, perhaps with book two, perhaps with paper next. Um, <laughs> and um, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, and thank you, yeah. everyone out there in the audience for joining us. Um, this has been The Daily Space. We are brought to you by a collaboration between the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, Youngstown State University, and Ward Beach, uh, and the Planetary Science Institute. Um, we are part of CosmoQuest. Please visit CosmoQuest.org where you can do science. Thank you so much for being here. And um, Good luck giggling over your spectra. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye, everyone. Have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever in the world you may be. <laughs> bye bye.